that the community will look quite different depending on what marker you are using for, for your barcoding, in this case at least. So that was kind of like an as a starting point for, for our study here. And if you go a little bit further and look at the CO1 reads, so in the Hen et et al study, uh, they, uh, or we rather, used the uh, Chime pipeline, and there you have like a, a threshold. So at 97% similarity, you consider sequences to belong to the same species. And if you apply that in the CO1, you have uh, most of the sequences are not assigned to any species. A, a vast majority of them are not assigned to any species, 92% of the CO1 sequences in this case. And almost as many actually with the 18S up to 83%. And then if you go to a much lower threshold, so you use what they call the phylum level threshold, a cutoff at 80%, then you get, of course, more of the reads that can actually be uh, assigned to a phylum. So you get another, uh, you get uh, then 690 metasoans that you can actually assign to phylum for the CO1 and uh, around 800 for the 18S, but you can see that there is still a, a large number of reads that cannot be even be assigned to phylum in this case, and especially for the CO1. So that is of course a problem. Uh, and this is uh, of course due to uh, the fact that there is not enough reference data, and so there's nothing to match against. And we have seen already that we have uh, a bias in the markers, so that the markers give uh, different, uh, uh, a different picture of the community. And this might be due, due to the marker itself, or it might be just the primer, that the primer doesn't work for, for a particular um, group of animals. It's very hard to design universally working primers for CO1, especially because it's fairly variable gene. And then, of course, we have the issues with the taxonomic assignment. What kind of species concept is 97% similarity? It doesn't really, it's not really an evolutionary concept, anything. It's just a more or less arbitrary cutoff value, which uh, doesn't necessarily correspond to uh, species by any more evolutionary grounded concept. Incidentally, I put a few photos of worms in here and there in the presentation, and they are, uh, of course, uh, A-seals, because that's what I'm working on mostly. That's the photos that I have, so. Uh, so then, uh, now uh, we get to our project that we actually have been working on the uh, past few months. Uh, and what we wanted to do here was we wanted to have a snapshot of the diversity on the Swedish western coast and southern coast, where we have the most marine conditions. We wanted to see if we can actually find the diversity gradient, because we have a salinity gradient along the west coast uh, with a, a decreasing salinity going from north to south. And that should be connected to a, a decrease also in the in the diversity of the megafauna. Perhaps it is certainly the case when it comes to the macrofauna that the, there's a high diversity in the northerly, more uh, saline parts of the coast. And we have a very long tradition of 
work on major fauna on the Swedish coast. Uh, uh, many of you are, I'm sure, familiar with Kristine Bay, which has been a sort of focal point for this for well, almost a hundred years or so, and there are many, many papers on various groups, various types of flatworms, uh, acidomorphs, mollusks, annelids, and so on. So if there is any place that is well known, where well, the fauna is well known, Christina Bay is certainly one, one of the best known places. So, so the question was, is, there, is it possible to still find new May fauna species, even if we sample in, in such a well studied location. And of course, we wanted to see what we can do about the uh, species identification in, uh, with a meta barcoding data set. So we picked five places along the coast. So, number one is at, at Tjerne, the the marine, uh, the other big marine lab that we have, which is very near with the Norwegian border. Number two there on this map is uh, Christine Bay. And then uh, we have a, a more southerly uh, location on the west coast at the city of Halmstad, the sandy beaches. And then we have two locations on the south and southeast coast. Åseberga and London. And the map here shows also the average surface salinity in the, on, uh, along the coast here. So you can see that you have marine conditions basically at one, two, and mostly also at number three. But the other, the southern, yeah, southeast coast are, are more clearly brackish water places. Okay, so the, the sampling uh, was done so that we took two or in some cases three samples of uh, 500 cubic centimeters of sand that were taken at 1.5 meters depth. We brought this back to the lab and made magnesium chloride extraction there um, according to a, a standardized protocol. And then the, the, the we used a sieve to, to uh, capture everything that we could suspend from the magnesium chloride extraction. And um, then uh, the, the sieve contents were frozen in or stored in 95% ethanol at minus 20 until, until they were, until the DNA was extracted and the PCR was uh, performed. So we used two markers. We used um, uh, 18S, uh, the same region that was used in the Hane et al. paper and in other papers like the one that Francesca and co-authors published a couple of years ago, for example. So it's the v V1 to V2 region of the 18S. And then we used a fragment of uh, C1, which uh, was the, um, designed to contain this mini barcode region has been um, suggested for uh, CO1. And uh, the, the primers there were, um, one, uh, one of them was uh, designed by us to capture more the uh, flatworm sequences which have been absent from previous studies as you, as you saw. I showed you the tree from the hen and study. And then of course, uh, sequencing was done on Illumina and we made three separate libraries uh, with amplicons from all samples so that we could have replicates and, and try and avoid sort of random biases. Uh, and then it was just normal Illumina sequencing and initially normal processing in, in Chime 2, Chimera removal and, and, and the standard stuff that is done in metabarcoding studies. And just to um, convince you, I mean, we also did this initial processing in Chime where you 
have this phyla cut off at 80% and the species cut off at 97%. And I'm just showing you here uh, a rarefaction curve for CO1 to demonstrate that we actually sequenced deep enough to achieve rarefaction, I think, and to actually capture all the diversity that was in the samples. Uh, and, and with, with a good margin. Uh, for CO1, we blasted them uh, against uh, GenBank and then used uh, Megan for, for uh, OTU assignments for finding sort of putative species. We had a special focus here that is related also to the Swedish taxonomy initiative. We wanted to look specifically at four groups of mayofauna organisms where we have been working and where, the, where we have reference databases. So that's the acils, the gastrotrix, macrostomorphs, which is a subgroup within the flatworms, and rhabdoceles, which is another flatworm group. So, uh, so we were sort of picking them out for a special study because we felt that we had a reference library there that that, that could uh, allow us to do more in-depth uh, species identification. So a couple of words about the, the reference alignments. So, so we, for each of these um, groups, uh, we constructed a reference alignment with all the sequences that we had available. And we, we, we made an uh, alignment with the uh, with, uh, MAFT software and then we made uh, Fabinetic trees and we were using them to place the reads that had been classified as, for example, as ACEs in previous steps. They were then, uh, we then used the software PPlacer to place them on the reference tree in a a maximum likelihood based approach. So for the ACLs we had, for example, we had 343 18S sequences in our reference database and 185 CO1 sequences and so on. For gastrotrix, macrostomores and rhabdoceles. So for each of those we made a reference tree. And first, we can look a little bit at the um, total composition of the OTUs that we found. And uh, the takeaway here, I think the A here is the 18S assignment to, to large organism group, not even phylum, but higher group. Uh, and and C here is the CO1 results, and what you can what you can see here, what is most I think striking about this one is that for CO1, almost half of the sequences could not be assigned to anything. So they we can't even say whether they are an animal or or a ciliate or whatever those sequences where they come from. Um, and this is in completely consistent with prior studies, even actually a little bit better than most previous studies. So there's lots of, of problems with using C1 for this kind of over, overview study because the sequences, the reference uh, database is not good enough to do the uh, even the phylum or higher level assignment. For the 18S, it's a lot better in this regard. We have about 7% of the sequences that couldn't be assigned to any major group. And as you can see, there are about slightly less than half of the sequences in the 18S case are assigned to metazoans and 
less than a third are assigned to methasoans in uh, the CO1 case. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we had this um, question whether we could find the diversity gradient going from north to south. The north here is on the left, and then we're going uh, to the southernmost, southeasternmost place. This is, the, is to the right here in the in this diagram. And I think the answer to that is probably that there is, wasn't really any clear uh, gradient that we can uh, detect here and, and it looks a bit almost a little bit contradictory also in the 18s and co1 uh, data here but uh, that's just because probably just random variation so we were not able with those only those five sites in this snapshot of diversity to find a, a diversity gradient overall in our in our sequences So if we look at, uh, uh, if we zoom in a little bit and look at uh, the meta composition of the metasoan sequences, the ones attributed to metasoans, and look at phylum level and compare 18S, that's A, and C1, C, in this figure uh, we can see that the, the pictures are quite different in both cases uh, we can say that arthropods and nematodes and flatworms platyhelminthes are they are the big three that i think is true in both of these uh, data sets but the relationships otherwise and what groups are included and so on look quite different. So the communities will look quite different depending on which one you, you focus on here. Then we went on to try and look at our taxa of special interest. And so we have uh, where we try to make the species identifications and where we have these special reference databases. And if you look at the A seals, the initial uh, analysis uh, found 37 different OTUs of ACLs and those uh, corresponded to um, 15 uh, different species so there are some there are more OTUs than species in many cases and that's because the, you can think of that I think as haplotypes so you have um, uh, some species with some sequence variation and that is sort of taken care of by the likelihood, uh, the p plays or the, the phylogenetic likelihood uh, method of analysis. So it doesn't uh, automatically assign a new species to any, any variant or uh, any substitution. Uh, but it it uh, it uses a model to place them on the tree, and in the case of the ACLs and the 18s, there were only two of the sequences, two of the OTUs that could not be assigned to a species, and they could still be assigned to um, to genera, uh, Archaeophanostoma and Mekinostoma. And for the C1, you can see we have 25 OTUs. So those are, remember, those are samples from the same places, from the same sampling jars. And uh, you, we find uh, uh, 
37 OTUs in 18S and we find 15 species. We find 25 OTUs in CO1, only five species, and there are five um, uh, OTUs that cannot be assigned to any, any group. And then we, can, we could go on like this through the uh, table, but I think the, the take home message from this one is that uh, uh, the ACL database was, is, is fairly comprehensive. It has uh, a lot of the species on a worldwide basis. So we, are, we can quite easily uh, identify uh, most of the stuff that we find. And on the other end of the scale, maybe, is the rhabdocytes at the bottom here, where we found 141 OTUs, but we can only assign 19 of those to uh, species. I'm talking about 18S now, because as you can see on the CO1 side of the table, it's pretty useless actually for identifying species. Uh, mainly depend uh, because the reference database is just not uh, populated enough to work. Okay, so a few general comments about uh, CO1 versus 18S. So CO, as I said already, CO1 has 41% unassigned sequences. And that's not just our finding, but that, that happens usually in, in, in a lot of previous studies as well. Uh, and we could find we, we could identify far fewer species with CO1 than with the with the 18S fragment that we were using. And that is of course because of the uh, incomplete database uh, for CO1. And uh, Another observation that we made was that there is a very, very weak correlation or almost no correlation between the number of reads and the number of OTUs. So the, the body size is probably the important factor here. So, so arthropods and, and nematodes is the, is the example that is mentioned in, the, in our paper that they, they have a fairly similar amount of, of OTUs in, the, in our analysis, but the, there's many more reads from arthropods. Of course, they seem to be in, in general larger body sizes in that group. Okay, so um, a couple of comments from the of Swedish uh, perspective now. So, so we, uh, the total amount of sediment that we analyzed here was 6.5 cubic decimeters, 6.5 liters, so a small bucket of sand. And in that we found 1,639 OTUs based on 18S. And that is a pretty high diversity. It's higher than previous studies. Uh, for example, uh, even those that have been made in the tropics, like the one by Francesca Leasi and co-authors a couple of years ago, for example. Uh, we uh, found a few AC sequences that could not be assigned to anything um, in CO1 and also very high variability in some of these 18S OTUs that I was talking about, uh, which to us indicates that we still have some, a few undescribed species uh, in the, on the Swedish beaches, despite uh, all the studies that have been conducted there. Uh, it could also be worth noting that out of the 25 species of aces that occur in littoral habitats on these beaches since we now know that are record, have been recorded there in the past, we found 12 of them in these uh, 6.5 uh, liters of sand. 
uh, and uh, we also have found a few uh, unassigned OTUs of gastrotrix, also some with high variability in the 18S OTUs as well. So there's also indications that uh, there might be additional gastrotrix species, despite our efforts in the past few years. Uh, for the rhabdoceles, we, we could only conclude that the, the database is not really good enough to, to draw many conclusions about species and what species are present or not. Or not. So yeah, that's, that's it for, um, for this little uh, metabolic coding study and thank you for listening and well thank you for to sweet the swedish taxonomy initiative for funding our work and this is a, a photo from the Cherne marine station where we did some of the sampling